thanks everybody. First of all, just to check, can you all hear me? Great. And I just, have, first of all, it would be helpful for me just by show of hands to understand who you all are. That is because I was unable to be here this morning. I was actually being a grandmother chasing after my three-year-old grandson. Um, so <laughs> I'm afraid I missed much of the morning talk. So um, just by, who here is from the elementary section? Thank you. And the secondary section? And various allied health professions? Great. Am I missing anybody else? Sorry? Primary. Primary. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I'm hoping that there'll be something for everybody here. Um, by contrast to some of the talks this morning, I'm really going to be focusing on the educational perspective of ADHD and taking another look at it. So not from the medical field, but from an educational field. And I'm starting off as following on the theme to allow you a bit of transition time for a different speaker. And this is from a book um, by Trudy Knowles. This is the voices of adolescents and young adults talking about their experiences in education. Um, and some of them are very poignant. This one by, is called Letters by Rob. I thought would be a super one to start off this stopping for a minute to think from these youngsters' perspective about what education in the schoolroom, the classroom, must feel like from their perspectives. So, as always, it's the letters. ADD, ADHD. This plethora of letters, they all describe me. Can't pay attention. It's messing with my education. But do you really care? And I'm going to end up with that education because here I'm going to be focusing primarily on learning not the behavioral challenges that certainly are present, but arguing that we need to focus a lot on the learning and the learning gaps that they have accumulated often throughout their years. So first of all, we're going to say, how are we to understand ADHD from an educational perspective? Does it help us by listening to the medical description? Does it help us in education understand what this ADHD is? The second part of this presentation was say, well, why do we need to worry so much and why am I talking so much about the academic attainment? Does ADHD itself have a significant impact on, it, on academic functioning? And of course, the critical question is, how can we optimize academic outcomes by which you should have inferred, obviously, that there are indeed pretty tough, poor academic outcomes unless we do something for these youngsters? So let's start off, and I'm going to start from the typical medical perspective, and I find that I have to switch hats when I'm working at Sick Kids Hospital, and then when I go out into the school system and school boards or talking with teachers who are doing various degrees at OISE. From the DSM perspective, ADHD is still classified as a disruptive behavior disorder. It, way, it's come back forwards, it, the behavior, this difficult to manage behavior, is assumed to account for the poor academic outcome and any poor social relationships and any other problems these youngsters have, all attributable to the behavioral symptoms. Accordingly, under that medical model, when we want to look at treatment, we target the disruptive behavior symptoms to try and reduce those symptoms, whether we do it by pharmacological means, or behavioral interventions, the whole treatment goal is to reduce the manifestations of those symptoms. And it is assumed that if we do that, the other things will naturally all come to be in place. So we will also be addressing the academic functioning and the social relationships. Because it's assumed that the trigger point is the symptoms. By contrast, a neurobiological perspective has a different kind of thinking. And that is that there is recognition, of course, that these symptoms are often difficult to manage. They're very overt and often in your face. But there's a key understanding that this is a neurobiological problem. And it's in fact these neurobiological difficulties that give rise, let's come this way, um, they, they cut, sorry, let's come forward. The neurobiological problem gives rise to the poor academic outcome and poor social relationships. So therefore, if we think of treatment, it's slightly different 
because there, the whole notion is to try and target aspects of the neurobiological outcome, typically in terms of alterations in the chemicals in the brain, so the neurotransmitters that help self-regulation or are necessary for self-regulation. We can do that pharmacologically or via behavioral, but it's not sufficient. The argument from the neurobiological perspective is you need to do more, that there needs to be also specific targets for the poor academic outcome because of the numerous gaps in learning that will have occurred by the time the child even enters kindergarten, and likewise for the social relationships, that we can't assume just by suppressing the symptoms of ADHD that everything else will fall into place. They need to be directly targeted, and this is really the focus of my talk. We see, of course, and what draws attention to itself is this difficult behavior, the impulsivity, the running around in the classrooms, the not listening, the shouting out, the calling out, etc., and also daydreaming, being distracted. These are the superficial symptoms that draw attention to themselves and often, not always, but are the cause for triggering to seek assessment. However, if we look more closely, rarely if ever, do ADHD symptoms themselves trigger referral? It's because of the other problems that go along with ADHD. Difficulty with peer relationships, the difficult academic performance, the kind of sliding slowly behind in school, really is what triggers the referral. And so we need to struggle and understand why are these youngsters having so much difficulty learning and they're functioning, why? By definition, by the way we diagnose ADHD. These youngsters are average and above average IQ. We can't assume it's a lower general functioning that gives rise to these poor outcomes. And what it is, it's below the surface is where we have to go and dwell a little bit to really understand ADHD. So not what you can see with your eyes, but what you'll need to know about to understand. And I'm just going to show a couple of slides just to give you the kind of essence of why we need to be concerned. And that is, it's well documented now by a group of researchers from the National Institute of Health who were able to image the structure of the brain over a couple of, at least two or three times for each youngster. It's a very large sample, male, boys and girls, uh, who ranged in age from something like 6 to 20. And who they also were able to look at those who were being treated with medication versus those who weren't. And what the data have looked at is they measure the thickness of the cortex, which is an index of the maturation of the brain, of the cortex. What we know is that in development, the cortex thickens up to a certain point, and then usually somewhere around adolescence, it starts thinning again as you get pruning and more efficient connections across the brain. But the thickness of the cortex is an index of brain maturation. And what these researchers showed is that although the overall development is in the same direction as typically developing youngsters, in youngsters with ADHD as a group, the maturation is about two to three years behind. So the development is the same. This is not something like a regression of any sort. But what we need to think about is where the delay is occurring in the maturation. And it's in parts of the prefrontal lobe that are and other areas of the brain that are really responsible for self-regulation of both emotion and behavior and complex thinking. So clinically, we need to keep in mind about a two to three year discordance between chronological age and self-regulatory ability in these youngsters with ADHD. So intellectually, they're at chronological age. Life experience, they may be at chronological age. But when you require and expect them to be able to self-regulate, you have to stop and think that, hmm, although this youngster is nine, he really isn't able to regulate himself as a typical nine-year-old. There will be a little bit maturation. By this point alone, it tells us in education, we have to be prepared to provide support and accommodations for these youngsters a lot more often and a lot longer than one would think.
What we know is that although many of these youngsters, not all of them, but many, move fast, faster than I remember being observing up at a class up in Owen Sound area, and we were doing this systematic classroom observations, three, you know, 10 seconds observing what the youngster was doing, five seconds coding what we thought the youngster was doing, and I'd been doing this systematically. I looked up, and the kid wasn't there, just gone. Had no idea where, nobody knew where he'd gone, he just vanished from the class, totally. Um, so they do move fast. <laughs> um, but the processing of information is typically slow and effortful. And it's often hard to keep this in mind as you're working with youngsters. Because if it's slower, it means that even when you're speaking and giving directions, they're going to have to take a little bit longer. You may need to repeat it. You may need to speak a little bit more slowly in order to give them an opportunity to access what you just said. So processing information is a bit slower. And this is generally to do with a whole range of problems we don't really fully understand, but there are clearly genetic factors, clearly environmental factors that interact to give rise to alterations in this availability of neurotransmitter during effortful processing. Simple things, not a problem. But we need a lot of these neurotransmitters around in order to get the signals passing along various networks in the brain. And because of these alterations, which we really don't fully understand, um, but what we do know is the outcome is very inefficient and effortful brain functioning. So when these youngsters turn to us and say, oh, it's too hard, I'm tired, they probably are. It will be like having to operate in a second language for with which you're not very familiar all day long. It really hurts to think. Or perhaps a better analogy is if any of you have had flu recently or heavy colds, no matter how hard you try to concentrate, you can't keep it going for very long. It's exhausting. And often the youngsters, the adolescents with ADHD, tell us this is often how they feel. So we should expect, given that we know there's going to be a delay in maturation of critical brain areas, slow and inefficient processing, we would expect there to be significant impact, a negative impact on academic attainment for many, but not all, of these youngsters. And the data I present here are from the Canadian National Longitudinal Study of Children and Youth plus the Ameri equivalent US study, National Longitudinal Study. And what they do when they do these large scale studies of thousands and thousands of kids is to use rating scales of us parents and teachers to complete the rating scales. And then they say in the, if you're in the top 10% of symptoms of ADHD, that's roughly equivalent to a diagnosis of ADHD. And what they looked at was to see, given if you're in the top 10 percentile of ADHD symptoms at, at year X, when you work four years down the road and you then measured again, looked at these ratings, looked at their academic outcome, it predicted a decline of 8 to 10 percent in achievement scores. So if you think about a kid, if, you, what if, if we translate that into what it means, kid entering grade one, bright, gorgeous kids, bouncy kids, but tough to live with and teach kids, they come in eager to learn. And if we don't fully understand or support them, they are likely to decline by 8 to 10%. And this is horrendous. This is not accounted for by concurrent learning disabilities. These researchers also looked at that. So we're telling us that we need to do something because we're already losing potential for these youngsters, which is really concerning. We know they're overrepresented in high school leavers, so they're much more likely to leave school early. And even if they go back and later try to pick up credits, overall, youngsters with ADHD still tend to have at least one year less education. Also, the subset who do successfully complete school and get to universities and colleges, unfortunately, when we're studying them too, we'll see these youngsters continue to struggle. Um, and they often end up with lower GPA or start dropping out because obviously the whole context of university, colleges, is tough. So it means in our high schools, we've got to really think and prepare these youngsters for the transition. And I guess my main argument is always, no matter what grade you're teaching, you need to think several grades ahead to say, where do they need to get to? 
because if, we do, if every grade goes by and the kid is beginning to fall behind, the gap will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you always need to think ahead to what I call backward design to say if we know where you want to get them to by the end of the grade, the end of the next grade, we then have a chance of really focusing and, and making sure our interventions are effective. The study was repeat, replicated with a slightly older group of youngsters, grades 7 to 12, and also followed at one year and six year. Essentially, this, this is just the US data set, the same findings. Top 10 percentile of ADHD symptoms increases the risk for grade repetition, special ed, suspension, expulsion, lower grade point average, dropout, etc., etc. It's a pretty dismal story. Um, and for any of you who are parents of, of youngsters with ADHD, this is dismal when you hear it. But, and this is why I always say, but this is something that is absolutely possible to eliminate this type of academic decline. Just out of interest, think of students in grade three, and you give them independent seat work. How long do you think the average grade three-year-old can pay attention to their seat work? By show of hands, let's start with 10 minutes, seven minutes, five minutes, two minutes. Okay, now what about ADHD? Students, elementary students with ADHD about grade three. 10 minutes, seven, five minutes, two minutes. You're right on. <laughs> Shows the experience. And although you may know it, I think it's also very always important to say, can, is it just, if when you know it and you see it in your youngsters you're teaching, that is important to know, but it could be just a particular sample of kids you're seeing. The research study here is saying, let's take a huge group of students and look at these students in real classrooms. And they observe these students over uh, 21 minute consecutive intervals and just looked at to see who's on, task, who's on task, who's not on task. It was very clear that youngsters with ADHD fell in two distinct groups. One group who had more difficulty concentrating, but not markedly, and that was the, what we call the ADHD high group. And the other group was the ADHD low, had real, real major difficulty staying on task. And what we see here is the top line is you're typically developing students in the classroom, in the same classroom as these youngsters with ADHD. And on average, they're about 80% on task, and it's increasing as time continues in this particular context. The second line from the top is the um, ADHD kind of reasonably high attentive group who are concentrating about 60-70% of the time they're on task, but it doesn't increase across time. And then the bottom line is for the youngsters who are classified as low in attention, and they're only on task about 40% of the time. So you can imagine what they're missing and why work is incomplete. So if you were tr translated a different way, when you see the histograms, the bars, um, the white bars are typically developing children, and as, again, as you estimated, on average, they can stay on task without any other directional support, doing independent seat work at their level for about seven minutes. By contrast, the kind of uh, ADHD group with reasonable attention could stay on task for about five, but those with really poor attention only two minutes. Uh, and then obviously you have the inverse for the maximum duration off task, off task for five minutes at a time in the low attention group. That's a lot of time they're missing. So we can summarize this by saying typically this is the range of abilities that we in a class. Now I'm not sure if your classes are any different to the ones I've been observing over the last couple of years in various school boards. But on average, many of the lessons are 40 minutes, or depends in the high school, longer than this. And the youngsters are being expected to be on task that amount of time. So one suggestion I've often discussed with educators is if these are the data, is it possible to do two things? One, particularly at the beginning of school years, to really start honing down and shortening the expectation for being on task. So to arrange small periods for on-task work and then a shift and then another short period 
And your goal over the year is obviously to increase the duration. But to start off with a you know, one hour liter literacy hour is to me sounds a little bit challenging or the writing hour or whatever. So I think it's sometimes often just thinking how you could break up your lessons to having a smaller units on time, smaller frequent units. And I think we might therefore be able to stretch the amount of time on task for these youngsters. I'm now going to switch to say, well, this is ADHD, but in fact, it's the attention that's really the bummer for academic outcome. Hyperactivity impulsivity itself does not predict poor academic outcome. But inattention symptoms are often so difficult to observe in a classroom because they don't grab your attention. It is these inattention symptoms that cause the problems. And this is a study of about 400 youngsters followed from kindergarten to grade five in the United States. And the te in kindergarten, teachers were asked to rate the children's behavior in the class across a, a number of dimensions, inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, kind of emotional reactivity, and so on. This is not talking at the diagnostic level. This is just a few questions about a few symptoms. And what they found was that the inattention predicted reading in grade five. So that, and the reading measure was a composite measure of decoding plus comprehension. They weren't able to pull that apart. Even when the researchers controlled statistically for their IQ, hyperactivity and emotional problems and their reading ability in grade one. Moreover, when these researchers said, my goodness, then we've got a huge group of students who are at risk. So we need to get in and do some preventative work. So they looked at a school-based tutoring on reading in these youngsters. So it came, took about almost 600 youngsters, and they were classified as those who had reading difficulties. I'm not talking about a reading disability as a specific learning disability, but who were slower learning to read compared to their peers. Those who were inattentive compared to their peers, and those who had both types of problems, inattention and reading difficulties. They gave them three 30-minute sessions a week of phonics-based mastery approach, an evidence-based program that had been found to be effective in general in school systems. So what were the results? Well, they again have found that inattention, they replicated their own findings, that inattention predicted the reading achievement at the end of that grade, even after controlling for the various confounds. They found that those youngsters who had reading difficulties made substantial gains, very encouraging, and that was the program had been shown to be effective for this group of youngsters. Those who were markedly inattentive, the high-risk group, only made modest gains at best, but those youngsters who had both types of problems made no gains. One whole year, of no gain. That's really concerning. And having just tracked youngsters in the Blue Water School Board, we find the same thing. I'm not looking at diagnosed kids. I'm looking at kids who show marked inattention, the symptoms of ADHD, but would never come to service. I will probably never meet even a diagnosis. And yet, they're severely impaired when we look at the academic outcomes. So we can say that inattentive behavior unless it's addressed directly, is likely to predict poor response to evidence-based instruction. It's not just reading, it's math as well. So Lynn Fuchs and her colleagues wanted to understand what contributes to normal math development. So if you think of the three major areas of simple computation skills, etc., what they found was that in fact inattentive behavior as rated by classroom teachers, and this, they used an ADHD rating scale, um, predicted the development of math in these three areas, fact fluency and arithmetic, computation and story problems. Again, when they put an intervention in place, worked great for those youngsters who were not markedly inattentive, had, if you were markedly inattentive, had predicted poor outcome. So this is the kind of table they put into that particular study where they put a whole lot of things that might, they thought would contribute to the typical development of these, key three, these three key math areas. 
And although many, such as language, nonverbal problem solving, concept formation, working memory, sight word efficiency, all contributed to the development of these math skills, inattention had the highest loadings, accounted for the greatest amount of variance in these abilities. It's not just a North American phenomenon. This link between inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity is being found to be very clearly established worldwide. So this is from a huge Nordic um, epidemiological sample from Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. And again, teachers were asked to rate the children on inattention, impulsivity, hyperactivity, and they were also reported on their scholastic performance. The data are reported in odds ratios, so let me take you through this slide. Let's start with Sweden, and you can see an odds ratio of 4.2 listed with inattention and reading impairment. What this slide tells us is that if, for those youngsters who were rated as inattentive by the teachers, they were 4.2 times as likely to have reading impairment as those who were not rated as inattentive. Likewise, they were 12.5 times as likely to have writing impairment as those who were not rated as inattentive. And we can see I've highlighted, bolded all the symptoms of the inattention. And although hyperactivity and impulsivity certainly does contribute, nowhere near the level of inattention. So it really, inattention is a major component in classrooms. And this means that we need to think about all kids not just those who do get to service and do get a diagnosis of ADHD. So just to sum up on this particular section, we know that inattentive symptoms, not hyperactivity and impulsivity, are related to poor academic achievement. The problem is that inattention is not as noticeable in the class as the disruptive behavior, but it is the risk for academic problems. Inattentive behavior signals, and as soon as we see in it somebody being inattentive in classrooms, it should signal us that there is underlying cognitive problems. So what is attention? And just bear with me for a couple of slides to go into the kind of science of attention, because often what you're looking at does not necessarily give us all the information. You could be looking at me, but I bet about 90% of you are thinking, oh, it's so hot in here. Um, so you might be looking, your eyes are at me, but your mind is elsewhere. So often we can't just take where the kid is looking to indicate exactly whether or not they're paying attention. But what the researchers have done is Michael Posner, who is probably the leading expert in studying attention from a cognitive perspective, has found over many, many studies over the years that there are three types of networks of attention, that they're neuroanatomically separate, they're chemic, neurochemically separate, and they're functionally separate. The red little boxes you can see scattered on the brain, and it doesn't matter really exactly the locations, but they're not residing in one place in the brain, but they're networks. That's the alerting network, and it's controlled by norepinephrine. In fact, norepinephrine is one of the neurotransmitters or a chemical that is targeted by some of the, the non-stimulant medication that's used to treat ADHD. All medications that are used to treat ADHD are not that specific. So most will target several neurotransmitters. The orienting is the blue is again orienting that comes under acetylcholine, and that is not part of any of, currently any of the treatment for ADHD. And the yellow triangles are executive function that you probably heard about this morning, and that comes under the control of dopamine. And things like methylphenidate, that is probably a widely used medication, targets primarily dopamine in the brain. What we find from the research is most research studies find that individuals with ADHD, children, adolescents, and adults, are, show impairments in alerting and executive function. So it's often the alerting which is necessary for all, everything else that is a problem. So alerting is literally just being ready to hear information. So these adolescents that I saw kind of coming in and sort of slumping down on the table, um, often sitting back to front, etc. their brain is not in any way receptive to information. They're not yet alert. They're probably still sleeping. Um, orienting is the where you look and what you listen. 
And mostly it's the, in classrooms, what's the challenge is to try to suppress competing ideas or emotions while focusing on what you're supposed to be doing. And that is a major area uh, of problem for these youngsters. So we can sort of begin to link the medical symptoms with the problems in the underlying attention networks with what we see in a classroom. So for example, difficulty sustaining attention to tasks that require effort is probably problems in the alerting network, and that's when these youngsters say, oh, it's boring, it's too hard, yawn, look lethargic, kind of tunes out. The easily distracted by extraneous stimuli, perhaps problems in the orienting network, that's the kid whose head is on a swivel, interested in everything else around them except what they're supposed to be focusing on, and the difficulty organizing self, the executive function, and they're often forgetting the instructions and so on. We found that when we've been researching executive function, it's a very tricky, slippery thing to measure and understand what it is. I guess over the years, I've come to thought of executive function as the behavior we'd like to see, but I can't find a cognitive process often. The only process I can really find reliably is working memory and inhibitory control. These are the two processes we can measure, whether we're doing it with our tasks in the laboratory or doing neuroimaging, we can see what's happening because they're a bit simpler. And what we found in research and other people around the, uh, the world are also now finding more and more is that we know that inattentive behaviors we've just talked about predict poor academic outcome. We also know, though, that work poor working memory and other executive functions seem to underlie the observable inattentive behavior, and also slow processing speed contributes to that. And in turn, poor working memory contributes to poor academic attainment, and this is well established from the group from England, and they've done a series of longitudinal studies. So we call it this triad of problems that we always concerned about. So if we're looking at one, we want to see what's happening to the other. So we talked about the slower processing speed, and just to highlight how these little categories that the medical field has are a bit problematic. Kids don't fit into boxes neatly, and the medical field are fully aware of this. It's just the best way of shortcutting, of trying to um, give some clarity to the problems. But ADHD and, and dyslexia share problems in processing speed, and they also share problems in working memory. Also, youngsters with communication problems have problems in working memory. So this is not anything specific to ADHD. So just give you a sense of kind of explain why working memory is critical in a school context. I'm going to give you an instruction, and I can only say it once. So are you listening? Are you alert? Are you listening? So I want you to listen to my instructions, and then when I show you the next slide, I want you to say which one of the four is the correct response. I want you to draw a triangle to the left of a cross, but to the right of a circle. Which one is correct? Hands up for A. Hands up for B. Hands up for C. Hands up for D. <laughs> it's actually, if I say it again, if I now show you an advance organizer, so I'm going to tell you now and give you a chance and repeat it. Let's try it again. I'd like you to draw a triangle to the left of a cross, but to the right of a circle. A, B, C, D. Yeah. So that purpose of that is that to indicate that if I just gave you instructions without too much warning, without setting a scene, without giving you some kind of organizing information, you would, many of you didn't get the correct answer. So in school, in the classroom, often simple things like repeating it, chunking it, giving some kind of advance organizer will allow these youngsters to access the information they're supposed to access. So we know that a recent study looking at that type of instruction found that these youngsters were slower and less accurate in processing instructions along those kind of lines. 
In fact, they were five to nine times more likely than their peers to get the wrong response on items like this. And they responded more slowly. We also know that youngsters with ADHD have difficulty answering comprehension questions after listening to a verbal explanation. And one of my former trainees, who's now at the University of Windsor, is continuing to do this work, looking at comprehension skills at like nine to 12 year olds. And there was, list so it was a typical science or social studies class. She was just giving them information and asked them afterwards to questions, one simple fact and the other inferencing. And the youngsters with ADHD, with supposedly, and according to you know, good, solid language skills, not dyslexic, not language disordered, were still poorer at making inferences and poorer at monitoring their comprehension. And if we think about it, to make an inference, you have to take a bit of information from one part of the text and something you already know, or from two different parts of the spoken language or the text and put them together to draw the inference. That takes working memory, which is just holds information for a few seconds and manipulates it. So they had really poor working memory and not surprisingly poor comprehension. Typical answers, were we here in the classroom? I don't know, can't remember. Often the answers were vague, they needed prompting, great word finding difficulty, and some answers were lovely. They were made up to try and make sense, just to try and appease us as researchers, presumably, but the information actually wasn't correct. However, what we did find is that if we gave prompts and allowed more time, then the quality and accuracy of their answers improved. And again, these are very simple things to incorporate in every day in classrooms to all kids but youngsters with symptoms of ADHD and a diagnosis of ADHD, that type of approach is essential for them to succeed. So the classic uh, from that same book that I started with, slow reading, and this is tragic when we see these the adolescents coming in now who we saw them often when they're seven or eight years old and were struggling, and they're coming back at adolescence, just really, ha they've had it with school. They're terrible at reading. Everything's their scores have gone way down. It says here, I'm a slow reader. In high school and middle school, I hated to read because it took me a long time. And I would have to read things over and over again. I would find myself at the end of the chapter and had to go back and read it all over again. Got to the point in middle school where I was sick of school and hated going. So what would that kind of tell you if you heard that from a student advocating, saying, I really can't remember what I've just read? What type of strategies would you put in place to, cut, to pr prevent that type of problem? Yeah. Reading aloud, possibly. For adolescents, it's kind of hard, though, if they're in a group context, because adolescents don't typically read aloud, right? So it's possible uh, for, the, for the grade school, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So some kind of pre-advanced organizer to get set questions that they're going to watch for to guide their reading. Perhaps a discussion about what they're going to read first. Many of these are techniques you use routinely in the classroom, but I think it's trying to frame it now to realize how important those techniques are for youngsters with ADHD. But what do we do now to optimize these outcomes for these youngsters? We can divide the approaches into two major fields. Those that focus on the child, typically focusing always on the behavior. So this is the traditional behavioral medication treatments, parent training, for example, uh, social skill training of the kids. The whole focus is trying to alter, reduce the symptoms of ADHD. Rarely are these child-focused ones really trying to target academic functioning unless the youngster has a concurrent learning disability. But ADHD itself, rarely do we trigger and think about the academic focus. Another approach is really promising, and that is teacher-focused, because if you think of the hours every day these youngsters are in school, and that is increasing the awareness of, of ADHD and the update as you are doing right here, looking at instructional strategies that are working and a kind of a mixture of behavioral and academic. And preliminary evidence is suggesting that the latter is imp important.
I'm just going to show you the outcome, though, of behavioral intervention that is the typical approach at the moment to ADHD. And this is from Russell Barkley, his work that he did with um, kindergarten youngsters who took the really best trained teachers, the best trained studies, etc. 158 kids, and they were randomly assigned to just go into straight kindergarten, whatever was available, or to go into kindergarten, but they had offered parent training or to go into kindergarten with parent training and a special kindergarten class that focused all the teachers and the assistants were trained in behavioral management. After this one year, the effects were no effects from parent training because the, basically the parents couldn't get there. They had too many kids, too many other challenges, and if you don't go, you're not going to benefit. The, it looked very promising. The teachers of these club students thought that the whole class of these youngsters with ADHD were much better in terms of their attention, their aggression, their self-control, etc. And there was some support by an observer going in. Two years, absolutely nothing. The whole thing had washed out. So when the treatment was stopped, that very intense behavioral treatment was stopped, it didn't continue to have an effect into the next academic year. So undeterred, they started again. And in the second time, they just did a better system of the school management, the classroom management, compared to no treatment. But again, essentially, there was nothing after two years, and everything got worse. So again, it was showing that despite the best behavioral interventions they could come up with, they were not helping at all with the behavior, and the academic achievement was declining over that year. The multimodal treatment study that many of you, I think, have heard about from the United States is the longest study that we have here, one of the largest studies, 600 youngsters, were randomly assigned to these four programs, whatever you could get in the community, the best psychosocial treatments you could imagine, parent training, social skills, homework support, uh, teacher assistance to help in the classroom with behavior, manage very, very carefully managed medication, or the combination of very, very careful managed medication with the psychosocial treatments. After 14 months, positive effects on ADHD symptoms. No difference between the medication and the combined medication and psychosocial. Much better than the other two treatments. If we take this pattern of findings that managed medication plus combined psychosocial and managed meds didn't differ, but they were both better than the psychosocial alone, it's telling us that medication was the effective treatment here. However, that was very encouraging till a little bit later down the road, the findings made no difference in the long run. And more importantly, no effects at all, no robust effects on academic achievement in these youngsters. So although youngsters might look as though they're sitting still now, they might even get better report cards, but mostly report cards, as you know, reflect an admixture of actually doing, you know, behaving or handing in the material, doing the homework, and their learning. So when you test them in terms of an achievement test, there was no effect at all on their gains in academic achievement. So, Behavioral approaches are quite problematic, and I think it's because they don't take, generally take into account the cognitive problems of these youngsters. They don't address this minute-to-minute -minute variability in symptoms, and they certainly don't have um, imp uh, improvements in academic achievement. Why? But at least if we just give a little animation of why, I think it's just little simple tweaks to behavioral management might make a difference. And my, uh, my argument is that when we give these behavioral um, consequences, first of all, the behavior has occurred, whether it's desired or undesired, after which you put in a consequence, a positive consequence for the desired behavior, and you might put in a response cost for the undesired or whatever. But unless you're mag magicians in a busy classroom, you, the behavior and your consequence rarely, if ever, occurs within a few seconds. If the youngster is to learn the, the, the connection between the behavior and the consequence, it has to occur within the time frame of working memory. Otherwise, there will not be learning going on.
So I think this is one reason. So if we think you're wanting this youngster to concentrate on their work at hand, what happens often is this kid starts concentrating and you're busy, you're walking around, you notice the kid's concentrating, you're great, you go in there and you start give good concentrating, Matt, but unfortunately you caught the kid as the behavior was waning and perhaps they were beginning to go off task. So often as I've sat in classrooms, I see very good intention, behavioral management strategies, physical proximity, praise, etc., but they weren't temporarily linked within a few seconds. And so often, inadvertently, we might be reinforcing the wrong thing. So how you can tweak it is by using what we call the pre-cue, the prompt. So before you want the behavior to occur, whether it's going out of the classroom and lighting up or whatever, you just prompt for what that has to do. So and if the youngster states what they're to do, either in their head if they're older or youngsters can choral that response, by saying it, it will be in their working memory and therefore likely to guide their behavior. So if you prompt for the concentration, okay, it's now time for individual seat work, and remember it's working on there, keep your hands to yourself, or whatever your, your rules are that you've set, prompt first and as soon as you see that youngster doing it, Praise the, any approximations, particularly for really challenging youngsters, and ignore when they go off task. And these have been shown to be very effective by doing a pre-cue beforehand. So it's an antecedent approach rather than just a consequential approach. You're still doing your consequences, but you've brought it all within the time frame of working memory because you're present to pre-cue. So... What works for ADHD and for what? A recent review, I think, gives us the somber picture to emphasize what I've said. The efficacy of methylphenidate, psychosocial treatments and their combination in school-aged kids with ADHD, this is a statistical meta-analysis taking many, many studies to say, let's put them together to see really what the field is stating from the research perspective. And it says, both methylphenidate and psychosocial treatments are effective in reducing ADHD symptoms. However, the psychosocial treatment yields smaller effects than other treatments. And for improvement of academic functioning, no treatment was effective. And it's a sombering thought. So we need to rethink ADHD. We need to keep in mind that these youngsters with marked inattention, whether or not they have a diagnosis of ADHD, are likely to have deficits in working memory, language, and other cognitive skills, slow processing that's going to affect their learning in the classroom. The traditional treatments are not designed to improve academic performance per se, and there certainly is no strong evidence that they do so. And I bring this slide because I believe that this is the key, a clue that we can use it's well documented that symptoms vary throughout the day, throughout the lessons, etc. And they seem to increase with high cognitive demand or when there's little active engagement. We suddenly see the increase in fidgeting, talking, etc., etc. If that's the case, if it varies by context, then we as adult educators can go in and use that context to, have a, to modify it slightly to have get better control over these youngsters' attention and learning. So we're gonna rethink as a cognitively based problem, antecedent, and the goal, again, I'm present, gonna present this different way, one very major powerful tool that's shown to be effective is by simply reducing the complexity of instructional language. Your spoken instructions, and often, and I look at the workbooks, the textbooks, you have to reduce the complexity of the written instructions because they're too dense for many of these youngsters to process despite good IQ because of their working memory problems and slow processing. Taking the learning situation into account, the context, providing instructional supports with what has these various put visuals up, etc graphic organizers. Again, these are not magic bullets. These are things you all do but you need to do it with greater intensity, more frequently, and for longer with youngsters with inattention. 
And we also need to teach specific strategies. So let's give some examples. Um, the trouble is with the research is that most of you sitting here will say, yes, it's all very well. Research studies are fine, but they don't translate. And you're absolutely right, and I'll address that in the next talk. The research does show, though, that this type of uh, consultation and academic intervention does have a big impact for youngsters on ADHD in terms of their math skills and reading skills. So this is when you work with one of the support specialists to guide you in terms of altering, accommodating within the classroom. Teacher professional development over a series of workshops. A workshop like today will not change practice. A workshop like today hopefully will increase an awareness and an interest, but it is not sufficient to change your practice, nor is it easy to change practice. But it can be done, and I'll show you two. This one particular one was done in Spain, where they worked with a series of sessions for the teachers, um, about two sessions a month, talking about ADHD as we might have done today, but just taking it step by step, not in one great, huge, you know, mess sort of a, a, on one day, which is tough. But they also focused on behavior modification techniques, so every teacher had an understanding of how to use these effectively, so they were trained, rather than getting it second hand or third hand. They were all trained on these cognitive behavioral strategies and instructional strategies to use across the curriculum. At the end of those, that particular session, there was marked reduction in the ADHD symptoms of, in the youngsters in those classes and improved academic scores. So we have several studies now that have shown that by teachers really working together as professional learning communities over a period of time, this cannot be done you cannot go in on Monday and make a big difference. You can go in on Monday and just say, okay, I'm gonna pick one or two things, maybe one thing. Let me just listen to my own instructions and see and just simplify them, repeat them simply. That alone will make a difference as shown by Kenneth Rowe and Rowe, who show very dramatically how just reducing the sim and simplifying your instructions enhances attention and the academic outcomes. But we I think when we think of ADHD, as you've heard here, it can't be done just with you in the classroom and the kid alone. You have to build good home school partnerships to begin with, right from the start. Create the supportive classroom environment, use proactive approach, and use strategies. What do I mean by the building home school partnerships? If you think of all in the school system, you've got the parents, teachers, you may have psych psychologists, physicians, you may have other various support services. All of you need to come together to make sure you're giving the same message and have the same goals. Because from a parent's perspective, it's very challenging if one person is emphasizing one aspect and another another aspect, and sometimes inadvertently might seem to contradict. So this is why a school team approach obviously is the answer. But even if you've done a really good networking school team approach, there are still challenges. From the parents' perspective, they may be themselves have the same problem. They may have more than one kid with the same problem. They've had many years of negative feedback from neighbors, from family, from everybody. So school is just yet another negative feedback. There also may be cultural differences, so they may not be comfortable with the school context. And the school culture itself could be pretty intimidating for some parents. So although you always do this for every parent, and you're doing homeschool relationships, I think for here, it's absolutely essential to think proactively what might enhance the communication between home and school when dealing with a youngster with ADHD-like symptoms, regardless of whether there is a diagnosis or not. And that is, first keep in mind, the parent might also have some of the similar challenges. And that means that you need to provide an advance organizer. So making sure that there's a date and time set that works, and actually ask for input ahead of time to allow the parent to think through what they might be able to contribute, what they might want to ask,
because without it, they arrive and maybe have rushed from work, being careless, they may have been already called from work to come and pick a kid up out of school because of misbehavior. All of these things are complicated for these parents. Again and again, we see, and I'm sure you've heard it many times today, to highlight these kids' strengths, not just their weaknesses. And it's so easy when we're busy during the day to kind of, you know, make sure we're contact when something's going wrong. But for parents, this is so important. My argument is for every one, quote, negative contact, you need at least two or three positive contacts of what did go right today. And most of importantly, just as you need an advanced organizer to explain what the topic is, what ask the parents what questions or concerns they might have, to give an indication perhaps of what your, what your concern is here, afterwards to provide a written summary of those plans. Work, if, if you all know when you go into a doctor's office, you become sort of passive as though you've lost your memory because you, you might nod and say, aha, aha, as the doctor tells you something, you come out and think, what did he say? Was it once a day, two a day? I don't remember. It's exactly the same for parents leaving a school classroom. They might have nodded and agreed, but will have no recollection of what happened. So always an immediate summary to do with them as they go out of the door. And regular communication, not irregular communication via homeschool notes, whatever is the, works well for you and the parent. I think the important thing is for, to make sure that both you and the parents work together to seek and share and understand more and more about ADHD. To, if you're going to use behavioral management, make sure you're going to target the same thing at home and school and only one thing at a time. It's really hard if you're trying to do one thing at home and another thing at school. It's too much for the parent and the, and the teacher and the kid. It's confusing. So have an agreed upon target and model and prompt, obviously, good behaviors. When we're looking, though, now at the environments, think about the physical environment. And this is when we looked in the classrooms and we look at the research. This is often the first thing that's, that's addressed. But you also need to think of the affective tenor of the classroom and the school towards these youngsters. The organizing it to reduce distractions and promote engagement. The materials to be easily located and stored, a constant challenge. But if the materials, the students' materials aren't organized, then they're not going to be able to work effectively and are going to be constantly searching, as you know, while you're trying to teach. So again, trying to work out proactively a plan for the materials using key materials, whether it's work that has to go home and get back between home and school, in bright fluorescent binders or something that totally different color to the backpack, because the backpack is this black hole. And many notices, as you all know, if you're a parent and or a teacher, they just get shoved down the back. So usually having one binder with notes always on one side and something else on the other side is with pockets is perhaps the most effective. And writing down the homework, we all know this is again, trying to establish a systematic routine that you as a teacher aren't always responsible. That is the biggest challenge, but trying to set up a buddy, a study buddy, another youngster, a senior student, whatever, to help with this, to try to get the kids writing it down and handing in. But again, we know in classrooms these days, it's getting harder and harder and harder because there is greater and greater diversity, not just with students with ADHD or ADHD-like symptoms. There are students with many different types of mental health problems, with learning problems, with major cultural differences. And I guess to me, one of the major issues, and I think obviously part of this play that you just heard, is really arguing this more and more to really support and talk about individual differences so that in some ways everybody's different in some way or another. The classic simple things of four to one ratio of positive feedback, it's so easy when you've got a challenge in class to always end up with one kid, did you hear me? And sometimes it's, you get into that, that pattern, very easy, but we always say back to a four to one ratio. Think of four positive things for every one negative. <laughs> 
The other is a low queuing, queuing system. Many of these youngsters are embarrassed. They have very low self-esteem. School is not a pleasant environment. So when names and loud announcements are made and attention drawn to these youngsters, it's a real concern. Emotionally, they often have great difficulty dealing with what we call the tenor of a classroom more than anything else. They feel stupid, and as you go up the grades, it becomes harder and harder because you want to be accepted by your peer group, not targeted out by the rest of the peer group. So these kind of low queuing systems agreed with the student, what the student thinks will help them, rather than what you think might work for the student. And many of the adolescents that we work with are very able to tell us what would work. And they are, when they say, have you, have you explained this to the teacher? They say, no. So sometimes you may have to prompt them to say, what do you think will work? This is going to be a problem. We've got to deal with it. You can't go on like this. What do you think will work? And let's try it. And that is a starting point rather than trying to put anything else in place. And again, another simple thing is over and over again, modeling, teaching and modeling problem solving approaches. Anytime you're having a, a challenge dealing with a situation, the strongest approach is for you to do think aloud so that the students, all students, are used to hearing that, that you're having challenges with a scenario. Your think aloud and modeling strategies is going to be a more powerful teaching tool than anything else, a list of instructions, for example. So it's you modeling everything, whatever you're doing, a particular lesson, a particular behavior problem, is, a, is an effective approach. We talk about active engagement, and that is when we were just up in Blue Water, this is um, elementary school classes, um, what we were finding initially at the beginning of the year was that usually a, in a, an hour, or say 40 minutes, maybe five kids had an opportunity to respond because it's the hand up bidding system. But over the year, when the teachers started to think of different ways of getting responding down, and so that most of the time, most kids were responding in some way, whether it was to a buddy or to a, their notebook or to the teacher by voting, then we found that the ADHD symptoms declined dramatically in the class because it's almost impossible to be actively engaged in work and be ADHD. Your, the symptoms are incompatible with focusing and engaging in the work. So I'm going to go over a couple of things that were found to be very, very effective. And again, these are simple things. I've already mentioned them. But these are the Australian researchers, Ken and Kathy Rowe, who were looking at the children with attention problems, whether or not they had ADHD but found out that they really couldn't hold and process spoken language very effectively. For example, the five to seven year olds really couldn't hold more than seven words at a time. If I listened to utterances in a classroom and if you quantified the length of my utterances, they're usually around 25 to 30 words. So it's telling us that most of the time, the youngsters aren't going to process much of what we say. Eight and ten-year-olds, uh, more than nine and ten words. Their rule of thumb was as follows. Youngsters sh who have no problems with literacy, because these youngsters had a lot of problems with literacy as well as attention. The rule of thumb was you should be, a kid should be able to remember a length of sentence or an utterance that equals their age in years plus four. So a seven-year-old should be able to remember exactly an utterance that's seven plus four, 11 words long. Yet we see here, these youngsters who are markedly inattentive couldn't hold more than seven. So this is why we're saying these youngsters miss so much of what is going on in the instruction, including sometimes your reprimands. Um, to treat them the same, they wouldn't process it all. So using shorter sentences, or at least repeating your sentence, um, in a simple way, and pausing between the chunks allows these youngsters time to process this information and hold it in working memory. Otherwise, it's gone. 
So we always say, obviously, we always know we've got to gain attention before giving instructions. One of the most powerful techniques that has been found, though, is when you've got a couple of really challenging students, is to position yourself near those students and make sure you maintain your eye gaze. It's a powerful tool. You don't need words. Just looking at the youngster as you give those instructions. Hold it a little bit longer than you typically would. Holds their attention. Simple things like enunciating each word clearly will automatically slow you down. You don't want to speak like this because that would overload working memory the other way. But if we speak at a typical normal speaking rate, it's far too fast for the majority of these youngsters with attention problems. So we need to chunk the information, pause between the chunks, and repeat. Often it's helpful to get the kid to repeat back the instruction, but not to elaborate. And this is very hard, it's natural in teaching to, if you have to say something again, to elaborate. Fair enough when you're talking about teaching material content, but when giving instructions, uh-uh, repeat it exactly the same way, else you've given them even more information to process and have often confused the youngster. This particular um, technique, they found that, the, again, the inattention really improved for the rest of the year and often continued into the next year, and the literacy scores improved. Um, it's a powerful study for such a simple, simple technique. The major challenge as we go up into secondary school is that more and more the students are supposed to initiate and sustain and be responsible for their own planning and organization. And unfortunately, as we, youngsters with ADHD grow up, this is one skill set that falls further and further and further behind. And so it needs to be modeled and really emphasize tremendously um, how we're moving on this. Materials is one way of managing it and helping organization. And there are many programs now, many of the school boards are now starting to bring in this notion of, first of all, a master binder for any particular subject area, for example, in the secondary school. So there's always one master binder. So when binders are lost, ripped, material falls out of it, there is no excuse because you can make a copy from the master binder. Having a, a binder which is clearly organized and labeled, as we say, it's not just sufficient to tell the kids to do it, but every single teacher, no matter what subject area, needs to be supporting and helping and prompting all students through this. Um, one of the schools at the, Brand, at the uh, Brandt Haldeman Norfolk School Board um, have now decided that for all incoming grade nine students, all teachers at this summer are gonna have a, a, about a three or four day workshop on learning different organizational strategies, working to work towards a, a binder that's gonna be effective, hopefully common binder for most subjects. So that all incoming grade nine students, no matter what subject area, will go over and over again the need for organization, planning, scheduling in the same way across the curriculum. And this was again because of the ongoing problems and serious problems seemingly with more and more kids, not just those with ADHD. So what we ended up doing is probably just doing the same kind of thing but systematizing it. So if you went to the website that we developed for teachers, the Teach ADHD website, you would see a schematic something like this. The schematic is just simply what I've been telling you, that as, as educators in your own classroom, you make many choices through the day, and we were just suggesting one way of thinking about your choices, categorizing them, so whether you're going to be altering the learning context, whether you're going to be doing small group, large group, individual work, that's the learning context. What you're gonna put on your walls, that's the learning context. Looking at your instructional language, can you change it in any way to enhance the, the youngster's comprehension and understanding? The instructional supports, these are the type of things, the organizers, the lists, the definitions on walls. Those are all visual supports which, which youngsters with inattention and working memory problems need visual supports all the time. 
It's not just sufficient, it's not cheating to give these visual supports. They need them at their desks, easily available to help because it's hard to hold all the information in their heads. And also we can talk about the strategies you can teach kids to learn um, the most effective way because strategies are action-based. They typically involve some kind of mnemonic and it allows the, the youngsters to, once they've mastered them, to use one acronym for multiple steps. However, whatever strategy you teach, you can't use it with new information, new content. If you're going to teach a strategy, you've already, you're now, by definition, are increasing the load, the cognitive load for your students. So if you're going to teach them a new strategy for writing, for comprehension, for science, for whatever it is, use it with information that the youngsters already have mastered because you're learning a new strategy. They will only be able to use that strategy effectively if it's learned to mastery. So it means that you will need to constantly model it, get the students to fill in one or two of the steps and go over it and over it. You're talking often 15, 20, 30 times, where often I've seen in classrooms modeling it once or twice and then go for it. And for most youngsters, it is hard. But for an individual with an attention ADHD, working memory problems, strategies can be really effective, but they can be yet just another burden. Can't remember the next step. I'm going to think um, so we should stop, give you a, a cooling off break because it is so hot, <laughs> and then come back for the last little bit. And I'll talk about some of the challenges of why research doesn't, it seems so frustrating and why it doesn't seem to work in classes. It's, it's, a comp, it's a good question. So the question is, if you've got compared two extremes of classrooms, one that's pretty much stripped down to you know, bare, bare minimum, and the other with every nook and cranny rich with every type of exploratory material and so on, which is better for, for ADHD? The simple question is probably neither, um, because of, we know we can't, there isn't such a thing as an ADHD youngster. They're all individually different. So some youngsters in this bare classroom would be more and more fidgety because there isn't something to engage them. Other youngsters would be totally, really, totally overwhelmed. But the main thing is that a youngster should be able to know where everything is. So even if there are dingle dangles, they should know where, where, where to look for it. And so if the youngster doesn't know where something is, the alphabet, the numbers, the blocks, that's a problem right there. So it could be bare minimum or full to capacity, but what's missing is the youngster doesn't know automatically where things are. So my belief is, to me, the judge of a adequacy of a classroom child match is that youngster should be able to know exactly where different materials are, where different visuals are. That we know then is a good match. But that, so that would be my argument, that too much can be a problem, but too little can be a problem. Sure. I mean, we're going to have always, we know for every child there are better matches than other match than others. And that's going to happen. In, that's life. 
Um, so it's trying to me to help the youngsters know that, you know what, mum and dad are different, a brother and sister are different, an aunt is different. There are different people and we've got to, the trick is working out how to work well with each person. So it always is going to be tough and there are going to be some years that are tougher. That's part of the core for all kids. It's just that if that is on top of a whole host of difficult scenarios, it just aggravates young things for youngsters with ADHD. But we can't constantly go switching teachers or switching classrooms. And when I look at some of the summer camps, even some of the camps that my kids went to, the, the basic premise was that once in a group, i.e. once in a classroom, there is no changing. That there are gonna be kids in the classroom you do not like. You don't want your kid to sit next to that kid. There's always going to be like that. But in a camp scenario, I think we have a lot to learn. That their argument is if a class is becoming dysfunctional, and that the kids are ganging up on each other, there's bullying, they won't share, they won't sit, you pull them from the mainstream school activities or whatever, and you work with this group. You don't punish, but in camps, they work with uh, different activities, so they're not going to try and do all of the regular sports training and swimming and so on until a group works together. So they get group dynamics working well. And if we think about it, camps are often only two weeks. So sometimes I think we should be prepared as educators, even though there's the EQAOs and there's all these extra markers that we've got to attain as educators, sometimes I think if a class is beginning to get challenging, we do well to model some of the approaches they've used in some of these camps. Pull off for a week, just forget curriculum for a week, get the class working together with good dynamics with the teachers and all the kids. You might make more gains then, faster gains than trying to struggle on. But we don't think of that because the pressure on teachers is to teach this curriculum as this kind of monster directing us all. And it's, a, it's tough, but I think we have to take our charge back again of our classrooms and our responsibility that when responsibility is not just teaching curriculum, our responsibility is teaching youngsters to problem solve to be good social citizens and to get on and learn how to problem solve and to deal with individual differences. So I think at times it's good to just pull back a little bit and work on those areas and then the curriculum will go faster. Sure, so let me just clarify, the, pre, the issue was pre-queuing. So instead of, instead of using a consequential approach, that the behavior has occurred and then you give a consequence, positive or negative, the argument is if you're going into a situation that you know is typically challenging for a class or a group of kids, is that before, just at the point of performance, just as you're going to move into that particular scenario, you prompt that kid, you pre-queue the kids or the group of kids what is the desired behavior? What are they to do? What's the most important thing they'll do? So you've pre-queued it. With younger kids, you can just get them to also choral it back to you. And that will put the, the behavior in their working memory. And as soon as they start to follow that guideline, you praise them. That's your consequence. But it's so tight in time that only about three or four seconds, it'll be in working memory. So then they'll learn that the cue, the behavior, and the consequence all hang together, and it'll begin to be learned as a unit, so they'll understand the good consequence. So it'll, eventually it'll be just a, a smile, a, um, will be sufficient. Um, it's often, yes, it's often, I guess I call it, in, to me, one of the major things is transitions, whether it's transitions within a lesson, transitions between lessons, is where we see more, more disruptive behavior occurring, whether it's going towards the mat, back to the desks, from the desk to the library, from one class to another class, from um, individual seat work to group work. Those transitions are always the toughest for these youngsters with inattention and so on. And so pre-queuing what is the goal, what is there to do before you, you get them to move is the key element, okay? And then immediately say, great, I like the way you're doing X or whatever your praise is.
It really does work a lot of time. It, it works very powerfully all through the elementary school system. It begins to be very, you need to be creative once you get to grade six, seven, and eight, and even more creative in the high schools. But with the adolescents, as we know, they also love attention, um, but positive attention. So often, youngsters, are, and this, you'll know more than I do as well, that many of the adolescents, they actually don't want to be picked out. Um, they prefer to be not too picked out, and that's when you need to go to what I call the low-key queuing, because they don't want to be brought up, for whether it's good or bad. Um, so it's, it is more challenging in the high schools.